I had a uh, three and a half page introduction of our guest speaker tonight. I asked him to send me a resume, he did, and this is the product of that and a few other words as well. Well, when he came here tonight, uh, he said, you're not about to read all that. So I left the room, I edited it a little bit, and hopefully Mark this will uh, meet with your approval. <laughs> Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling is a graduate of CBC from the class of 1971. For 40 years, he served in the Army. He served in Germany, Desert Storm, Baghdad, Northern Iraq. He was also the commanding general of the U.S. Army in Europe. 60,000 soldiers reported to Mark, and 100,000 family members. Mark has three awards as distinguished service medals, six Legion of Merit, five Bronze Stars, a Purple Heart, and the Army Commendation Medal for Valor. I'm editing. <laughs> give you about another 30 seconds. <laughs> he also serves as a military analyst for CNN. Brother Paul sees him all the time. I, I've told him already, I do not watch and he forgives me. I watch uh, the other station. <laughs> Mark has actually been to CBC a number of times. He's spoken to the leadership uh, class, and he Skypes in as well when he's not available to come here. <clears throat> when we asked him to consider this, he readily said, yes, I'll be there. I want to see my classmates the night before, but I'll be there with you all, and with the fathers and sons. Mark is married to his best friend, Sue. They have two sons, four grandsons, and soon, when you wrote this, soon to be five. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, Mark, when he retired after 40 years, moved to uh, Florida. He's also, where you've written a book called Growing Physician Leaders. It was published in May of 2016. It's a bestseller on, come on, Amazon. Amazon's health book list. So with a lot of pride, I introduce to you Mark Hurley. He doesn't go by general, but Mark Hurley. First of all, I, I want to just say simply, my name is Hurtling and I'm a soldier. I left here uh, St. Louis in 1971 and when I flew to West Point to become a cadet there, it was the first time I'd ever left the city of St. Louis and it was the first time I'd ever been on an airplane. Since then I've had the opportunity to visit or be in 117 different countries, deal with the armies of, in my last job, 51 different countries. 51 different nations. I've had dinners with privates and presidents, and it's fascinating to come back and see the love in this room. But the first thing I want to tell you about is a surprise that happened to me last night. You know, when, when uh, Tim and Michael asked me to come back and speak to this group, I was going to Chattanooga for a work event earlier this week. And uh, I didn't want to fly back to Orlando, so I came up here a day early, and I wrote to one of my classmates, Pat Heider, and said, hey, I'm going to be in St. Louis, you want to go grab a beer? And he said, yeah, let me get a couple guys and see what happens. Well, last night, uh, I came in, we, we went to a, a bar on, on Manchester, and about 30 of our classmates were there. Now, I graduated in 1971. It's 47 years later. Most of those individuals who were at that bar last night I hadn't seen in the last 47 years. It was a spur of moment thing. It was a cold Tuesday night. They all had families. And in fact, I talked to Gavin here, uh, my best friend from high school, Pat Heider, had a son who went to CBC, uh, Bobby, who I happen to be his, his godfather. And now Bobby's got a son who's attending the class of 2022 with Gavin next year. 
the words brothers for life mean something. You all are just beginning to see it. Uh, having traveled the world, I feel like I can always come back here and when I do, when my wife, my wife and I are both avid Cardinals fans and we come in for a couple of games a year, it's always fun to link up with the folks who I left here almost 50 years ago. So, thanks for inviting me, first of all, to talk to you. Um, as Michael said, I'm now working at a hospital. I'm doing some things with physicians on leadership, and that's a whole lot of fun. Uh, they welcomed me there. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story about going from the Army to healthcare, because somebody said, why, why the heck are you leaving the Army and going into the medical field? And I said, because I didn't see enough combat in the military. There's a whole lot more going on in healthcare. <laughs> when, I, when I got to this hospital, uh, what generals sometimes do is wander the battlefield, that's what we call it. So I was going around checking the different places out, going to all the different organizations, and one day, you know, I had an appointment to go to the Transplant Institute uh, to link up with a doctor to see what they did there. Doctor met me at the door, welcomed me in. I said, so what exactly do you do here? He said, well, what the sign says, we do transplant. I said, well, yeah, I, I got that, but what, you know, tell me more. I'm not a physician. He goes, well, you know, we, we replace hearts. We replace lungs. Sometimes we actually, we've done some experimenting with, with replacing hands and legs that have been amputated, and we've had some pretty good success. He says, and right now, actually, we're, we're experimenting on something we're calling a brain transplant. I said, really? He said, yeah, this, is, this hospital I work for, Florida Hospital, is pretty innovative. So yeah, we're starting to do brain transplants, and in fact, we've got uh, some brains that have been donated from people who have died, and they're in the back, and if you want one transplanted, transplanted, it all depends on how much money you have and what you're going to pay for it. Because if, if, if you have $500, uh, a, a doctor's brain is $500 an ounce. And he said, and if you want a lawyer's brain, that's about $1,000 an ounce. It says if you want a college professor, it's about you know three thousand dollars because they have a lot of knowledge. He says, and if you want a general's brain, we've got one of those in the back. I said, really? Well, how much is that? He said, well, that's it's like four hundred thousand dollars an ounce. I said, I said, why is it? And I, I'm being hooked in. I said, so why is it? Because generals are that smart and they've been all over the world. He goes, no, it's just that it takes a whole lot more of them to give us an ounce of brains. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are Fox fans, you can quote that, that'll see it on Alex. <laughs> um, what I found is that physicians are a lot like soldiers. They have a great sense of humor and they're part of a profession. I'm not going to talk about that tonight because Brother Michael asked me when, uh, you know, I said, what do you want me to talk about? After he said, talk about 20 minutes, I said, yeah, that's not going to happen. He said, uh, talk, tell about your father and tell a couple of war stories. Well, I've got a couple stories about my dad. And my dad's name was Adolf. They called him Ace Hurtling. Uh, his grandfather was named Adolphus, named after a good friend of his that grew up with him on the south side. You can imagine who that person might be, Adolphus. Because my great-great-grandfather, Georg uh, Hurtling, who came over on the ship, this is a true story, by the way, came over on the ship from Germany, from Bremerhaven, with Adolphus Bush. And when Adolphus, I am not making this up, when Adolphus decided he was going to start a brewery, he asked my great-great-grandfather, Georg, if he wanted to do it with him. And my great-great-grandfather said, no, there's no money in beer, I'm going to sell it. <laughs> my dad, I have great memories, he died about five years ago, he was 95 years old when he passed. And one of the things he kept telling me as I was growing up is he would say, Mark, you have, the good Lord gave you two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. Use them in that ratio. Listen more, see more, and talk less. He also said, one of his favorite expressions was, you never have a second chance to make a good first impression. So make sure you make that good first impression wherever you wherever you go, and, and truthfully, in seeing these young gentlemen that were up here tonight, they make a good first impression on all of us. 
And the third thing he said, it wasn't share your toys. I, I thought that was, where's that young man that said share your toys? That, that was the classic of the night because that's what all fathers try and teach their sons. So that sums it up right there. But he always, my dad always used to say to learn the name of the janitors, the waitresses, the salesmen. And when I got into the army, it was all the privates and the sergeants who work with you and sometimes say they work for you. Because it's important to know who they are, to see the character of individuals, to see who people, how they present themselves and what their background is. He said, because everyone has a secret and a part of their heart that they sometimes don't want to tell, but until you can figure out what that part of the heart is, you can never get to know an individual. That's the secret, I think, to leadership, by the way. He was right about all those things, and thank, thankfully, I, I've taken the lessons he's learned, uh, or that he taught me, and tried to apply them in the 40 years that I was a soldier. Now. As I got into the military, I started learning things from other people. And to do what Brother Michael asked me to do is to tell a war story. I'm going to tell you my favorite one. Uh, and it relates really to time and preparation and relationships. And that story is about 22 minutes. Don't get excited, it's not 22 minutes long, it's about 22 minutes. It's something I used to think about after I heard it every day when I used to reach over and put my boots on when I was getting dressed in the morning to go to work. It's not a war story about the wars that I had to fight in recently in Iraq and Afghanistan. It dates back to 1991 and Desert Storm. It was my first war, it was my first conflict, and it was short and intense. Okay, here we go. Back in the late 1980s, I had the opportunity to be asked to uh, be sent to grad school by the Army and to learn exercise physiology so I could go back to West Point and teach to cadets in the PE department. So I was a big jock, and I was a captain when I was doing that. And some of the young people that I taught during that three-year assignments in 1991 were now part of the force. And I would run into them just like you would run into people that you're going to see later on from this class in different jobs in different environments. And so after that very tough four-day intense combat operation, I ran into, I was a major at the time, and I ran into a young man who had been a cadet when I was teaching at West Point, and he was now a captain, and he was commanding a cavalry troop. As we were talking about the four days of the war, and I was telling him about the fights I had been in, he was telling me about the fights he had been in. And one of the things he said, you know, sir, it was pretty intense. The fight this young captain had been in has since become known as the Battle of the 73 Easting. If you want to learn about it, you can Google it. It was an amazing fight. Uh, this young man's cavalry troop of 100 soldiers took on an entire brigade of Iraqi uh, army, uh, about 3,000 people, and they whipped them. 100 against 3,000. started telling me about the story, and I was just enthralled by the things he was saying, you know, about the way it had taken place. And he said, sir, you know, he said, you're a major. He says, you've got your own helicopter out here. I was with a cavalry squadron. He says, it's only about 15 minutes away. Let's fly up there, and I'll show you the battle. Now, I'm sure many of you have been to Gettysburg or Shiloh or Vicksburg or someplace like that, and you know the monuments are all in place, and you can walk the field, and the park rangers take you around and show you what happened, and they illuminate the thing that occurred in the Civil War. If you're lucky enough, you've been to Normandy or Bastonia or the Hurricane Forest of World War II. Well, in this case, when we flew up there, it was the battlefield two days later. There were still burning tanks all around us. As I said, he had killed 3,000 of the enemy, so there were bodies everywhere. It had rained all during Desert Storm, so in the middle of the desert, you could see where people had walked, where the tanks had run around, where the fire had exploded, where the artillery had landed, how the people had been shot. 
And for the next couple of hours, <coughs> this young captain and I walked the battlefield. And what we would do, uh, he, would, he would show me how his soldiers had maneuvered to set up a fight, how the tanks had come in to gain situational advantage and how they had fired on the Iraqi <coughs> tanks. He had shown me the spot where one of his medics had run up and, and, and there was blood still on the ground and he had uh, bandaged the wound of one of his own soldiers. Um, he, sh he described with tears in his eyes how a couple of his fellow soldiers had saved one of his soldiers' life. And the last thing he showed me on the field was <laughs> where there's a thing in the Army called an 88, an M88. It's a big recovery vehicle. So when a tank breaks down, it goes into the middle of the operation and pulls the tank out. Well, those are mechanics that ran those things. And he had shown me a spot where the mechanics in this 88 had come up, covered uh, a tank crew from fire from the enemy, lashed up a tank and pulled it out that had been damaged, all under fire. For six hours, this young captain described this fight to me. And while he was talking about all of his soldiers, he named them by name, first name and last name. It wasn't Sergeant Smith or Private Jones, it was <coughs> John Smith or Doug Jones. It wasn't just the story about what they had done, but it was a story about who they were and how they had dedicated their lives to one another. It became really obvious to me that he had built this 100-person company, this cavalry troop, into a family. They knew each other. They had each other's back. They knew the intimate details of each other's lives. At that point, I asked him what I thought was, for me, a pretty simple question. I said, how long did this whole thing, yeah, remember, we had been walking this field for about six hours. I said, how long did this whole thing take? How long did it take? And he smiled and he shook his head. He says, you know, sir, he said, that's the weird thing. He said, from all of our radio logs and what we recorded as part of the traffic and what occurred on the ground and what we knew from the first shot being fired to the last shot when no return fire at the end. He said, we think it was about 22 minutes. Now let that, think in, let that sink in for a second. 22 minutes. That's about a half of basketball if the clock doesn't stop. That's the amount of action in a 30-minute TV show without the commercials. It's about the amount of time it took us to eat our dinner tonight. 22 minutes, where a bunch of young men, not much older than you CBC students in here, and maybe a little bit younger than your dad, dedicated their lives for each other. And everything they had done their entire life, or at least their entire life in uniform up to that point, had been spent in preparing for the potential of that 22 minutes of life and death situation. 22 minutes where they had to do it right because they wouldn't get a chance to do it again. In combat, there's no home and home arrangements. It's not, we'll, we'll play you on our field this year, we'll, you can play us on our field next year. 22 minutes were all the training, the gunnery, the meals eaten together, the knowledge about one another, the counseling, the mentoring, the relationship. 22 minutes were all that came together because they were family. 22 minutes where they had to prove themselves better than the other guy. Because if they didn't, they'd all be dead. This was a story that I heard back in 1991, and it made a pretty big impression. And as I said, I, I tried to remember that story as I went to work every day as a soldier, because I knew that no matter what organization I was in, I had to prepare for the potential of 22 minutes of intensity sometime in my life. And what's fascinating is, I saw all this in 1991, and had to return to combat in 2001, again in 2005, 
<coughs> again in 2007, and again in 2008. <coughs> and there were similar stories where the young men and women who were soldiers <coughs> under me did something miraculous in 22 minutes because that was the only choice they had. Now, what I'd suggest is my reason for telling this story to you all tonight is because no matter your job, no matter what you do in life, no matter what you do in school, you all have been given a great gift in coming to CBC. Because you get to know a lot of similar-minded people, and you get to really hone your leadership and your character. You have a bunch of values instilled in you, the value of other people, the dignity and respect you show to others, the religion that you all participate in and the theology you all learn makes you who you are. And you're becoming brothers for life. Now, I don't know if any of you are going to be given the kind of opportunity or the kind of unfortunate situation that yet young cavalry trooper was in when he conducted that combat operation. But he might. And every day, there's a requirement for training, preparing, and thinking about the potential of 22 minutes where you're going to be put on the line, where you're going to be have to stepping up you're going to have to stand up for someone else and bring it home. What I've learned from my time in the Army, what I learned from my time at West Point, all started here. And I'll tell that that. That's why I keep coming back here. As long as they ask me to come up, because what CBC makes is different than any other school. They turn you into leaders. They make you responsible for the things that you someday, someday might have to do. So that's my message. Things my father said. I hope you remember those three things. You never have a second chance to make a good impression, first impression. You have two ears, two eyes, and one mouth for a reason. Use it in that ratio. And learn the names and the stories of the people you come across, no matter what their station is. And then get ready for the 22 minutes because you're all going to have it happen to you. And I'll add one more. Rely on your brothers for life because they'll be there for you. As I saw last night with the classmates that I met in that bar in Western St. Louis. God bless all of you and thanks so much for having me here. Before we get to the actual presentation of the Fathers of the Year, I usually uh, start with the idea that I ask all the fathers, sons, grandfathers to please stand up. Yeah, Reese, don't give me that. Please stand up. <laughs> opportunity, obviously, as we always do, to honor a few fathers of the year. But we're certainly, we're not going to negate the fact that each one of you are certainly fathers of the year. So, I'm asking son and father, grandfather, uncle, wherever the connection is, yes, to give a hug. Oh. <laughs> and while you're doing that hug, Think of gratitude and thanksgiving and blessing. Come on, come on. Okay, Fred. I said a hug, not knuckles. All right, if you sufficiently did that, you can sit down. Was that really that difficult? 
Hey, Frank. It's good to his father who says to recognize a role model in your life. Okay, at this point, I'd like, like to ask those seniors with whom I've been meeting over a couple days here to come forward, please. hosting tailgates, or later running to death down the sideline as a member of the chain game. You always invested so much time into the CBC community. I know Colin is extremely grateful for all the time you spent with him while he was at CBC. I, and I am also blessed to have you involved in my high school. Dad, not gonna lie, this is one of the hardest things I've ever had to write because it's so hard to, it's so hard to put into context just how grateful I am. I've had such a loving and involved father for the past four years. Dad, I also want to thank you for working so hard at your job. Thank you for all the sacrifices that you have made in my life in order to the opportunity to attend CBC. I know it helped shape me, Colin, into the young man he is today, and I know it helped shape me into the young man I am as well. Thanks to you, I've had the best four years in my life. Without you, I don't know where I would be. You're always there to listen to me, counsel me, laugh with me, yell at me, but most importantly, you're always there to take me to David Buster's. <laughs> but Dad, it just hasn't been the past four years that you've been a constant presence in my life. It's been all 18. I am grateful. I have you every single day of my life. Even when you are away on business, I know I can still count on you. At this point, all I can say is thank you. I know I haven't said it nearly enough, but thank you for the countless amount of hours you have put into CBC to make me have a school experience that's incredible. I am forever thankful for everything you have done for me and will keep doing for me. Thank you, Dad. I love you and congratulations. It's not just for what he does for me, it's what he does for everyone else. He truly treats everyone like they're his own and would do anything for any one of my friends, any teacher at CBC, any parent, anyone that ever asked him to lend a hand. My dad is the biggest role model in my life, just like many of you are to your sons or sons, your dads to your role model. I just want to thank my dad for everything he's done and if I'm half the man my father is, I will live one great life. Thank you.
Um, my dad's probably the smartest person that I know. And he's not smart in it, he knows every date in history, but he's so incredibly logical and down to earth, and he's never been able to not give me a good solution to a problem, no matter how little familiarity he's had with it. And he's also made his family his most important priority. He always makes sure he's home by six so that he can eat dinner with us, and he has never done anything at the expense of his family. In fact, several years ago, he decided to leave his job at Sigma Aldrich and buy a bakery to be a sort of family-run business. And some of my favorite memories are waking up at four in the morning and baking bread with him, or, and some others are sneaking into the pastry room and cramming as many chocolates we could as in, into our pockets when running away. Of course, the bakery was, let's just say, not the best for our family's financial situation, but that just tells you what kind of person my dad was. He valued family and the importance of togetherness more than money or anything else. Thank you for everything, Dad. I love you. Tradition, 
This was something I could have never asked for. From a long morning carpool to the late night games at the Afton Barn, you have always been there for me, you know what you run into. Sports have always been a big part of our life. Waking up Saturday mornings, or the only thing that mattered was college game day and what mascot head the course show was going to put on. <laughs> to the Cowboys Blues games and long days at the ballpark, nothing beats the amount of sports we loved and watched. Being able to step on the ice every hockey game, look in the corner and see the spot on the glass that the dad's blocked off, always put a smile on my face. Being able to know that no matter what, you will always be at any game or event for me is why you deserve this award so much. The countless hours of work you have put into me, but also for this school, so that your love for me and CBC will always be there. You truly resemble the father figure and the role model I'm always striving to be, and there's no way I would be where I'm at today without you. I can't thank you enough for all that you've done for me, and cheers from here in St. Louis to you in New Orleans. Thank you. <laughs>